Okay, so we're going back to our original markers. So protein misfolding. Okay, that is a very, very common pathway in a lot of neurodegenerative diseases. So protein misfolding. Almost every one that we talk, every neurodegenerative disease that we talk about has a protein, a misfolded protein associated with it. So in Alzheimer's disease, amyloid beta, Parkinson's disease, uh, alpha synuclein, Huntington's disease, the Huntington protein, and then ALS. There's a whole bunch of misfolded proteins, but really the superoxide dismutase one becomes a misfolded protein. So that's important. And I've just here, I can, I'm not going to go into all the details. I'm going to have a lecture on prion diseases where we talk almost exclusively about protein misfolding, but let's just give a general overview. So I'm gonna make my cell now very, very large because all this is happening within the neuron. Oops, gotta watch my camera. Okay, so you can actually see my dopamine neuron back there. But right now we're just kind of overlying the cell because we're gonna be going into the nucleus. So first of all, here is our mitochondria. Let's make this our endoplasmic reticulum. So just to get your bearings straight, right, in the MTC. Okay, so the mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum sitting there. And now we're going into the nucleus. So there's our giant nucleus. Here's our one strand of DNA. Remember, they're all, it's not quite like this, but it's just a representation. So another strand of DNA, so our double-stranded DNA. So by and large, proteins, right, come out of the process of transcription, meaning DNA to mRNA. The mRNA floats out into the cytoplasm, and you get translation at the level of the endoplasmic reticulum, but not the smooth. So this is now why there's different endoplasmic reticulum, right? So they're rough the studded endoplasmic reticulum. So those studs are ribosomes. Okay, so translation is that mRNA to protein. So the protein is the key factor here. So proteins, once they are translated, doesn't mean they're done, right? So if we go over here, let's make a protein. Protein comes out of the ribosomes and it's this flat out, laid out ribbon but that can't be, it's not functional. So how it becomes functional is it folds. So it goes into these really intricate folded structures. There's helices, there's sheets, there's all these really different interesting folded proteins. Most of that, it folds upon itself through just because of the charges on it. So those different amino acids have particular charges and they self fold. There's also ways in which they can be facilitated to fold, and that is through these, what are called post, I mean, post-translational modifications. So basically adding a phosphate. So post-translational post -translational modification of a protein is the addition of a phosphate, so it's a phosphorylation. So that's the simplest one, and that's what we'll just use as our overview. So phosphorylation, will help a protein get into its native conformation. So let's say its native conformation, its main folded structure looks like that because of the addition of a phosphate group. So proteins need to be folded to work. They jump back and forth between folded and unfolded states. So the normal conformation is called the native conformation, but there's also conformational changes and that means this protein can fold into some other structure to do an action, and then it folds back into its native conformation. So it bounces back and forth. But sometimes proteins get misfolded. And there's a lot of different reasons. As I said, we will cover these when we talk about prion diseases, but just keep in mind that, like I said, once a protein is translated, that's not the end of the story. It goes to be folded, and as it's folded, let me just zoom out a little bit. 
You can see my dining room table. Yes, I'm at home. So as it's folded, it can, like I said, it can bounce back to its unfolded or native confirmation state. But if it bounces back to this unfolded state or non-native state, it becomes very, it increases its energy. Let's just put it that way. It goes to a high energy state. When it's in a high energy state, it has the tendency to find other misfolded proteins that are also in high energy states. And they start to come together. They start to bind together, bond together, and they have a big party. I'm just going to move this a little bit to zoom in on that because that's where we're really kind of going with this. So with that free energy state, with a misfolded protein, they aggregate. So my example that I've used in the past in my 2200 class is think of scrambled, making scrambled eggs. So scrambled eggs can go through these conformational changes, or eggs, I should say. So if you have an egg white, right, an egg white is just in this one unfolded, let's say, state. But as it goes through conformational changes, as you start to whip it, right, it gets to be in a, it changes its conformation, and it becomes a whipped white egg, and you can use it for whatever, meringues, or making some nice desserts. Or you can cook it. But once you cook it, its energy, it goes into a different conformational state and all of those egg proteins start to bind together and aggregate. You have scrambled eggs and you have a clump. You have a massive clump. And once it clumps, once you have a scrambled egg or an aggregated protein, it's really hard to get it back to its native conformation or even an unfolded state. So those aggregates are really tough to deal with for the cell. So those aggregated proteins now start to take other resources from the cell. So somebody asked me about chaperones. So chaperones are proteins that try to deal, actually I don't want to put it there, I want to put it outside the nucleus. Not all folded proteins are outside the nucleus, some are, I will keep it there, some are inside, some can get outside the cell. See those? Zoom out. Getting excited. Coffee's rolling now. So we have aggregated proteins inside the nucleus, outside the nucleus, outside the cell. So chaperones are proteins that are meant to help chaperone these aggregated proteins out. Get them to go through, the, through another process where they can get chewed up or destroyed. But chaperones require fill in the blank. What do they require? ATP. ATP. So as the disease process, as more maybe calcium is coming in, calcium leads to post-translational modifications of proteins. Um, they can have there can be a genetic code that causes proteins to misfold. There can be disrupted chaperone proteins that because chaperones actually so they not only chaperone aggregate proteins out, but they help to chaperone proteins into their native conformational folded states. So if chaperones are dysfunctional, if there's a dysfunctional code, so in Huntington's disease, there's a genetic code that kicks, that automatically sends a protein to the misfolded state. In Alzheimer's disease, uh, there's oftentimes, you know, from a, let's say a stroke, high levels of calcium, leading to all these post-translational modifications, leading to misfolded proteins, aggregation of proteins. Wow, that's quite a drawing. So what's, what the, the, the main point, and not to get too much into this, is that aggregated proteins are really difficult for the cell to handle. As you get more and more of these aggregated proteins building up in the cell, more ATP being generated. What does ATP lead to? Reactive oxygen species. What does that lead to? Let's just jump ahead to, let's just go right to the lysis argument, lysis story. So lysis of the cell. So those, those aggregated proteins generating all these reactive oxygen species leading to an explosion of the cell, leading to, where's the space on here? In the May <laughs> Shun. That's the last pathway or the last part of neurodegenerative diseases that we'll talk about. So let me leave that up there. I'm going to post all these videos, so don't worry if... Uh, which it could be, and I'll be available for questions 
next week.